Good evening, everybody. I am Rick Wilson. Welcome to the strategy session. Tonight, I am joined, as always, by Joe Trippi, the great Democratic strategist, and by Stuart Stevens, the great Republican strategist. We are going to be joined tonight by Gavin Reynolds, who is a friend of the show, smart guy, Hell yeah. former speechwriter <laughs> to the vice president, knows youth politics, knows African-American politics, knows the national political scene, and is a is a absolutely terrific thinker about where the, the Democratic Party is going, where the campaign is going. And we're going to have some conversations tonight about a few big picture things. One, we're going to talk about Biden's polling, which if you listen to the national media is a is a doomed effort meant to plunge into the volcano of despair. But when you dig into the numbers, not so bad. We're also going to talk about DEI and the key bridge. We're going to get in a little bit to Florida um, and the Republican Party stepping on its you-know-what and then saying, this doesn't hurt enough. Let's put on some cleats at stepping on it again uh, uh, by putting abortion on the ballot this fall. We'll touch on Steve Bannon and wrap it up with a few other miscellaneous things tonight. So, gentlemen, welcome to the party. I want to thank all of our viewers for tuning in tonight. I know a lot of people are are pondering what's going on out there in the world. And I want to start with this assertion that Nate Cohn and others are making that Biden is struggling with African-American voters and Hispanic voters. Are the numbers where I'd love to see them in the 90s? No, they are not. Is the struggle real? Also, no, it is not. So I want to start uh, with this chart that, that shows the numbers that are out there for African-American turnout. Now, look, let's be real about one thing. And nobody liked Hillary Clinton. They just didn't love her. And that, that number, that weird bump there you see is where it's at. Okay. But we've got a number that Trump pulled off in 16 with African-American men. It didn't really scan much outside of the, the normal percentages we would have expected. Same with African-American women where, you know, they, they get it. They see what's going on. They're not going to touch Trump. This idea that Trump is going to swing an election deciding number of African-American men this year. I want to start with you, Gavin, and then I want to go to Joe and, and Stuart and get their thoughts as well. Well, first of all, thank you, gentlemen, for having me on. It's really a pleasure to, to be with you guys. Rick, this is twice in one week for the two twice of us. Twice in a I week. There we go. I know, yep. I, know our, uh, I know our conversation on your podcast hasn't come out yet, but... Uh, no, nope, coming out to tomorrow, I think. Okay. Okay. Well, I can't wait. Yeah, he's uh, front running it again, but it'll work. <laughs> right. Uh, well, look, this is a conversation I think has definitely been dominating the, uh, you know, the news cycles for a little bit now. I appreciate that you started with the history because I think it's important for just all of, you know, your viewers sure. to keep in mind, right, what has been going on up to this point. So since the 60s, obviously, the Democratic Party, you know, established themselves as the party when LBJ signed the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act that was sort of viewed as being the party that was sort of pro-civil rights and by extension pro, you know, the black community. And as a result, I want to say, you know, over the subsequent like 10 or so elections that we've seen since then, uh, between uh, like essentially during the 60s and 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, 2010s, we haven't really seen the Republican Party do much better than like eight, nine percent really ever. And I think there's good reason for that. Once again, like I think the Democratic Party in recent history has been seen as, you know, that party that, actually cares about expanding rights for the black community rather than sure. restricting them. I think where we are right now, again, there's been a lot of chatter about, oh, there's, you know, this realignment happening, black voters, especially black men, because we know black women are very, very solidly democratic, but the black men might be defecting from the democratic party in mm -hmm. mass. You know, I think polls can certainly tell one story. Uh, I think some of the polls that tell that story are a little bit shaky anyway, but I look at what are the election results that we've seen, right, especially since 2020 in the midterms and all the elections that have been held, you know, from then to now, they haven't really indicated that there is some mass exodus, right, of black right. voters from the Democratic Party. In fact, there's a recent poll that uh, Cornell Belcher, who's a, a black pollster, mm -hmm. is, you know, surveyed. Very numbers, smart guy. Very, very, very smart guy on TV a bunch. Uh, they yeah. ran a poll and they asked the you know black voters who they surveyed, what is the number one threat to the black community? What was number one? Another Donald Trump presidency, right? And number two was mm -hmm. white supremacy. And we know that there's a very, a very strong link, right, between those two. So I want to say that black voters know what's up, right, uh, with this election in the fall. To the extent that there is 
some sort of realignment happening. I definitely think we'll just have to wait and see how that plays out in subsequent elections. But what I think political scientists have been talking about recently is what they've termed as sort of an ideological sorting, where perhaps Black voters, who again have been solidly voting Democratic, Black voters are a little bit more socially conservative, right, on sure. some issues, right, with faith being a big, you know, element of, you know, the Black community historically. You know, so it's possible that for some Black voters who have been, again, voting for the Democratic Party for decades, they might now actually be realizing, okay, on certain issues, you know, I actually don't really align where the Democratic Party might be on that given issue. And they might say, okay, I'm actually more in line with the Republican Party and, and might sort of go that way. So it's not as if they're like, leaving the Democratic Party, but perhaps rediscovering that they might be, in fact, you know, more aligned with the Republican Party. Again, it's very, it's too early to really make any sort of conclusions on that. But again, the data that you just showed, like, it's not even close in terms of which party has a vast right. majority of the Black community. So I do still think it's going to be incumbent upon the Biden campaign to go out there, right? And between mm -hmm. now and the election, make clear, you know, hey, here are some of the things that we've been fighting for, right, for the Black community. Look, the wealth gap is, the, the you know, the narrowest that it's been in a very long time. We've seen Black small business growth really accelerate over the past three years. Mm -hmm. We've seen, you know, the Black unemployment rate drop to historic, you know, uh, historically low levels, you know, over the past um over the past few years, we've been working to address the climate crisis, which disproportionately affects right uh, folks in majority Black communities. A lot of focus right. groups have shown that Black voters they don't they might not be following that. And this even goes beyond you know the Black community. A lot of people just aren't tuned in to the work that's going on in Washington. But the the focus groups have shown that once you you know present to those Black voters, hey, here's some of the things the administration has delivered for the community. They're like, wow, you know, and that support only increases. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a real opportunity for the campaign to be really strong in the messaging and, and really convey to the community all the history. They, they, they need to be out doing the work, though. There's no yeah. excuse for yeah. not doing the work. Absolutely. Okay. So, Joe, you've been through a lot of these uh, uh, right. uh, at the presidential level. What are your thoughts on this? So, so I agree with Kevin on a bunch of things here, but I want to point out one of the things that we learned during uh, Doug Jones' race for uh, uh, Alabama Senate uh, when he won the Senate race in 2017. It was pretty amazing to me how I think it's more generational. The um, older uh, black community um, remember Martin Luther King, uh, remember Doug Jones like, taking on the Klan, the Baptist uh, 16th Street uh, bombing, uh, him going after the Klan and, and putting those Klansmen in, in, uh, away, uh, prosecuting them. Uh, and what we found when we were polling in the focus groups was, okay, under 40, they had no clue. Right. And history and what the hell have you, are you doing for me, for us now kind of thing. But as soon as we went into the community and started communicating exactly what Kevin is saying, um, here's what I've been doing, here's what I've done, uh, uh, telegraphing that credibility that Doug had built sure. uh, back then, man, they came. Uh, and of course, the women in, in the community rallied uh, the rest of the community to, to, to you, you know, and amplified that for Doug. Right. I, I think same exact thing is happening to Biden now. Sure, he was there then and, you know, did this and did that. Younger, uh, older uh, generation has that history with him, has that history that he was Obama's VP, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, and all that stuff. But it, it, with the younger, it's generational, I think. And the problem um, that I think Trump has is, okay, when the younger generation hears, you you know, where he is, where, uh, you, know, you know, all the racist stuff, all the all the uh, garbage that he's he's pounding on, you know, right. one of the things about about Trump is, he, you know, I, I'm starting to think of him as the sledgehammer campaign. Mm. He needs to bound, pound the sledgehammer to drive his MAGA crowd on a fire. And what that does will help us make the case to every generation, regardless of Latino, Black, et cetera, women. Oh, <laughs> that's what this. Oh, this it's that is. guy. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, Biden gets to fill it in. He's got to do the work, like you said, Rick. But I, I agree with Gavin. My only point is that I think there it's a generational disconnect 
um, that they that we have to prove as Democrats what we have been in the past and what we're fighting for and for their future. Right. I'm so glad you. Were, were, yeah, no, go ahead. Yep. No, sure. look. I mean, um, if I was in a campaign and and I was worried that uh, you know we, we might only get 91 percent instead of 92 percent, that's a pretty good place to be in. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it just goes back to history. 1956, I just find this amazing. Um, Eisenhower got 39% of the black vote. It fell to 7% in 1964, like Evan was talking about. Now, I think at the time you could have made a case that um, after the Civil Rights uh, uh, Bill was passed, Civil Rights Act was passed, uh, that more African Americans would come back to the party for cultural conservatism reasons, entrepreneurship, patriotism. Um, but it didn't happen. So mm -hmm. Goldwater got 7%, Trump got 8%. So that's one point every 56 years. So you, you do that math and, you know, it's, it's going to take a while. And I, I think that it's part of a larger trend here that as America becomes a minority majority country, that is really, I think, what is driving Trump. I'm of the opinion that Trumpism is more about race than any other issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand why the press doesn't call this out. You know, we have this this phenomenon of sending the best journalists in America to diners to ask Trump voters why it is. It reminds me of like sending the best journalists of America to strip clubs to figure out why men go to strip clubs. I think it's <laughs> obvious. It's you know, the like buffet, really, Stuart. Yeah. It's the really, buffet. It, it's really, always the buffet. It's, it's always the buffet. Um, and I think that... Um, you know, I read all these articles about evangelicals supporting Trump. Well, they're white evangelicals. Uh, you know, black evangelicals overwhelmingly you know, uh, support Biden. They're, they're, yeah. That's what really elected uh, Doug Jones, right, Joe? I mean, it was black mm -hmm. evangelicals. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that um, there's some reluctance to talk about this. And, you know, I get in these conversations with my old Republican friends and go, OK, Stuart, so you're telling me that everybody voted who voted for uh, uh, Trump is a racist. I said, no, I don't think so. Um, but don't get shocked that, you know, you say the 70 million people voted for him. Well, there probably are 70 million racists in the country. So let's don't get like carried away here. But um, I think that you, it means that you have to have something that is more important to you than electing a racist president, because mm -hmm. it's basically possible to deny that Donald Trump mm -hmm. is a racist. And I think this is a very comfortable place for Biden, Harris to be in. I think they know how to talk, how, yeah. how, to, how to run this campaign. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, how much, I, how much of the, how much of the, of, of this, you know, the, the argument that Trump is winning over unprecedented numbers of, of African American and Hispanic voters. I mean, I think about 60% of it is just a head fake. Well, can I can I just point out like the thing that drives me nuts about this entire conversation is okay, let's take it as gospel. We're we're down from ninety into the seventies with with blacks. We're down from you, you know sixty into the forties with Hispanics. We're losing young people to Donald Trump. We are. I mean, we just you know according to the, all this stuff. Okay, we're in a dead freaking heat with this asshole now. Right. <laughs> now, you, right. you, get, you get three points of any of those folks back, and you know, you yeah, know, and that's and the look, ball game. And it's over. I mean, Rick, and, Rick, and so, you, you. and so instead of like, geez, look at, look at, he's holding this despite all this other stuff. And by the way, that means he's actually gained with whites. Uh, mm -hmm. Biden has, um, and Trump's lost with him, um, which is, I think, big news in itself. Um, it just says to me the whole. I think Brownstein said that that Nikki Haley had left a, a, a trail of breadcrumbs for uh, Biden to, to, to uh, uh, follow to victory, just follow the breadcrumbs that she had laid out there. Well, okay, there, the Biden campaign knows. Go after the Haley voters. Go after, uh, raise our numbers with people of color. Raise our numbers with these young people. Mm -hmm. By the way, mm -hmm. what do we have to work with? Oh, geez, he's a, a, a climate change denier. Uh, he's a racist. Um, you know, it, it's he wants to do mass detort, mass He's an insane criminal. And, Other than that, mass detort. He's on board with imposing you know, Kevin, uh, All right, Joe, Joe, let me, yeah. let me interrupt for a second. Kevin, let me ask something. Do you, yeah. 
see in the community efforts by the Trump campaign, like on the ground? Are they really doing anything? Are they opening offices? Are they, you know, are they getting smart people to work for them? Do you, are there any, is there any evidence of this happening on the ground that you see or hear As about? far as I'm concerned, it's all the smoke and mirrors. Uh, I certainly haven't seen any of that besides some like, you know, Looney Tunes surrogates. He might pull on stage for a rally to be like, that's my African American, you know? <laughs> um, the classic. You know, but, right, besides, yeah, besides that, I think, I think, again, that's the reason why I think a lot of black voters just aren't falling for this because we know who Donald Trump is. And Stuart, I, I want to emphasize what you said, which is that I think Trump's outward racism is just, yeah. it's not enough, obviously, because you also, you know, the Biden campaign is going to have to put forth a reason why people should get off the couch to vote for them and not just make it a Trump's a racist. Yeah. So I'm going to go vote for Joe Biden, right? Um, but look, we know, and I wrote about this in a, in a piece for The Root uh, last, mm -hmm. last week, a few days ago, uh, about you know hate crimes like increased significantly under the Trump presidency, and not only did those crimes increase, but we also saw an under prosecution of those crimes, right? And so it literally is, and you know especially during the tail end of the presidency of Donald Trump with COVID and the mismanagement of that whole you know pandemic, right? That cost Black people their lives and and a whole host of other people as well. But you know I think the Black community knows what's up. Like Donald Trump could you know, try to engage in any way he wants. But I, I really, you know, the only thing I will say, you know, I think, again, I, I will say the only thing, right, because we know within all communities, we're, we are seeing this sort of fissure between college educated or, you know, sure. years with a four year. Degree. There's a class function across exactly. every group. There's a class function. And I think the Republican Party, right, if they decide to go in a direction in which they put forth and like, inclusive economic nationalist message could actually resonate with some, you know, non-college educated voters of all races, right? Sure. And so I think, do I think the Republican Party is going to go down that direction? I have no idea. Uh, but I think it's something the Democratic Party should be aware of, right? That, you know, they have to continue to put forth, and I think the Biden uh, administration has a strong economic track record to run on. But I think the party's going to have to continue to like understand and adapt to those dynamics, right? That we're seeing, right. that we're seeing shift. And, and, and again, it goes back to Joe, what you said, which is on the fact that now we're so much further from the civil rights movement that, yeah. you know, younger folks aren't like automatically associating the Democratic Party with civil rights to the same extent that, yeah. party, which you mentioned. And yeah. I want to, I want to move to our next topic because yeah. I think this is, there, there's what I always call is the is the MAGA parties, and it is the MAGA section of the party. Yeah. The MAGA party's endless quest for a substitute for the N word. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, it was 1619 Project. Then it became mm -hmm. CRT, and now it's DEI. Yeah. And I've I've talked to this about with my audience. We talked about this the other day. When they say DEI, they're just saying the N word. Oh, absolutely. That's their permission structure to say that word. And, and dog whistling it to their people. So this week, and Joe, you are a guy who has a deeply deep roots in, in Baltimore. Um, we, we've all talked about the tragedy with the with the, the dolly running into um, the, the 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 Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore and the loss of life and the enormous economic damage that's going on there um, because of that. Um, I think what we're actually seeing here is one more example of why. The DEI argument is so weak for the Republicans because we've seen a young African American mayor um, dealing with this problem. Like, and I, and I will say this, and I have roll their eyes a little bit, but I worked for Rudy Giuliani when he did things right in New York. When he didn't, when he when he handled problems and crises like for everybody, he used to say one city, one standard, everybody gets the same leadership. What we're seeing in in Baltimore right now, I think, is really inspirational. I think it really has thrown the DEI thing into an even more crappy contrast than it normally belongs in. Joe? Yeah, yeah no, think? absolutely. And you see like the Sinclair, the guy who owns Sinclair Broadcasting and, and, and who... Who now owns the Sun. Yeah, now owns the Baltimore Sun is is funding a super PAC attack ads on the mirror. And they're running, the, running these ads in the middle of the coverage of this disaster of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. It was like, it, it's just disgusting. With, I mean, no shame, no nothing. Uh, and look, and I said at the time, 
you know, will the guy who's doing this, like, for pull these ads down while a city's mourning and the mayor's just doing his job and doing it well? Right. Um, but also, I think it puts to shame the whole case that Trump's been making about immigrants. I mean, these are guys, the people who died on that bridge feeling potholes at one in the morning so the rest yeah. of us could make, you know, could get, get our commute going on time, Crazy. die, you know, from, from Honduras and, and Guatemala. Uh, and, you know, and, and Trump says, that we, well, they're not sending us our best. They're sending us murder. No, these these are and today he called them animals. Yeah, it, it just vermin, etc. It just I just think it, it is this. I, I, I hope will change some of that dialogue and bring people to understand what who these immigrants really are and what they provide to this country. And and this tragedy, I, I, I hope, will at least have that benefit. Yeah, I agree. Gavin. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Rick, uh, going back to what you said at the top uh, of this conversation about DEI being now synonymous for the N-word. I think this episode just made that even more clear, right? I mean, Baltimore is like a majority black city. Not that this deserves any like logical explanation whatsoever, but like Baltimore's majority right. black city, right? Like a DEI mayor would be like a white person being elected mayor. Like it just, it, I mean, the whole thing, again, just yeah, right. is nonsensical, right? But we know what's really behind that. And one of my yeah. favorite authors, one of my favorite authors, uh, Tony Morrison, uh, the sure. late Morrison has you know, referred to this sort of stuff as just it's a distraction, right? Like a lot of a lot of what the what the MAGA right is stoking up on social media and other forums, you know, when it comes to these DEI wars, and it's not just the folks hiding on social media. And I don't know if we're going to talk about this, but it's also governors of you know states across the country who are using this all to attack Black progress and prevent future Black progress, and it. At, you know, at, it's very, you know, most benign as a distraction to, you know, the progress that our community has been making and should continue to make because these are just trivial and trifling battles that we now have to be like thinking about and figuring out how to overcome. But like at, at the worst, like we know what, you know, that these are called attempts to truly hold the black community back and deny the value, deny the, you know, existence of, you know, so sure. many people in the country who, you know, come from different backgrounds. And Joe, I, I agree with you and what you were saying about immigrants, right? Like my parents both immigrated to this country from Jamaica and immigrants come here and serve communities in a whole host of ways. Some, you know, as the, you know, the, the late um, you know, people who are working on the bridge, but also as doctors and lawyers and engineers. Yeah. And, you know, they're just, they contribute, immigrants contribute so much to our country. And the fact that this was even something that we had to be talking about in the midst of this tragedy is really, yeah. you know. Yeah, it really is an absurdity. Great. Yeah. You know, uh, Gavin, you said something I think is really interesting. I, to me, at the root of the Republicans' failure to attract more non-white vote, particularly African-American, is, is, is a policy failure. Mm -hmm. They have never been able to come up with, I mean, we, I say they, I mean, I failed at it. We failed when I was working in the party. Mm -hmm. um, we, we never were able to come up with reasons that African-Americans uh, and, and should support us. Mm -hmm. um, and we never really did the work. I mean, we do these things like, you know, have empowerment zones or something like this. But yeah. it, it never, it never, you know, there was actually a period, it's so embarrassing to think about, when uh, you're doing campaigns, Republican, like back in the 90s, when they, Republicans decided that the reason African Americans weren't supporting us is because we didn't know how to talk to African Americans. So there was this phenomenon where they would hire African-American consultants to come down and talk to campaigns. And we were mostly right. white. And we would sit there and listen. Ricky probably did this. It's so oh, yeah. to think we did this. And, you know, they would say things, well, you need to talk about meaningful jobs, not just good jobs. And we'd all nod. And, of course, we do it and it made no difference at all. And, you know, the problem wasn't that African-Americans didn't understand what Republicans were saying. The problem was they did. And that, they didn't like it. Well, and they never could face that fact. And there was a complete lack of intellectual ability to come An engagement. Uh, yeah, like legitimate engagement. It was always yeah. like, can we punch the ticket? Can we just, can we cover the box? Can we check the box and then move on from it? It just, it really is. It yeah. really is. There's a, Stewart's written a lot about it. I've written a little bit about it. But that history is like, it's just bleak. But 
speaking of bleak, I want to move on to a subject that is bleak for the Republicans this evening. <laughs> and that is in my home state of Florida, and, and Gavin's a next door neighbor up there in Georgia, right. the Republican Supreme Court, which, by the way, folks, <laughs> is a conservative, federalist society, hand-picked Republican. Ron DeSantis is named like three quarters of the court. They've allowed two amendments to go on the ballot this uh, November, one on recreational marijuana, which is what it is. I, I always tell Democrats it's going to actually turn out more boomers than you think, uh, than more, more boomers than than younger voters. But OK. Um, and one to uh, protect uh, the right to abortion in the state of Florida, um, because at the same time they made this decision, they agreed with Ron DeSantis's six week abortion ban. It's like, can we take all the poison pills at once? Yeah, um, I wrote a lot about this today. Um, about the, what I'm hearing in Florida, uh, there's a sense of absolute panic among Republican consultants in Florida. Mm. It is not suddenly that it means that Florida is going to be on, you know, in play for Joe Biden necessarily, but it does mean Republicans are going to have to spend a lot more money in Florida to play defense now, especially down the ballot. So I want to start with you, Stuart, on this one and, and get your thoughts on it, then go to Gavin and follow up with Joe. Well, look, I mean, if you come up with a combination of, you know, put marijuana and abortion on the ballot, it's sort of like, you know, I mean, g- give me a break. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I think you know, I, I've been a contrarian on Florida because I think Florida is going to come back in the Democratic column um, mm. that that there are enough. It's really four or five states, as you know, better than anybody, Rick. And, and I think that there is a. Um, definite ability, if Democrats got it together, um, to appeal, uh, to be able to carry Florida. I mean, just again, Ron DeSantis lost a race to Mayor of Tallahassee, who was not a particularly well-known figure before the race, Right, what, 10,000 votes. He, 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 he scratched over, yeah, it was 66,000 votes statewide, barely made it. Um, and, and look, what we're seeing, I think, in Florida right now is something that gives the Democrats three big opportunities. One, it's a hook for registering young voters Mm -hmm. and women voters they've never had before. It's the single best hook that I've seen them, best gift they've they've had in ages. Number two, it's a turnout button that also talks to the same people we talk to, the Bannon line voters, uh, independent-leaning conservative women, Republican Mm -hmm. women over a certain age, Dobbs dads, these male, these, these these millennial and Gen X voters who have daughters between mm-hmm. the ages of say ten and twenty five, these people have all responded in other states with this like crazy. And finally, there's a model that's been successfully deployed in Kansas, Ohio, and Kentucky, and in other races in the last two years on how to talk about an abortion ballot measure that pulls in enough Republicans. It starts at 62%. This thing is going to be, uh, this thing is going to bleed the Republican Party. If the Democrats make it about liberty and individual rights and individual freedom, it's going to bleed the Republicans and cost them a ton of money. Yeah, no, 100%, Rick. Um, you know, I saw someone put a comment saying that it's going to be like November. Yeah, I definitely yeah, right. Remember, and I think Roe Biden is going to be coming out, you know, like full speed ahead. You're right. Yep. I agree. Look, I, I agree. You know, I don't know if Florida will necessarily. Well, I mean, the Biden campaign has said that they intend to, you know, put Florida in play after this news. And, you know, they have to say yep. that. I believe them. I believe them. I think they're going to be fighting really hard uh, in Florida, especially after this news. But, you know, because every single time abortion has been placed on the ballot, you know, it has won. And we saw this, was it last week, two weeks ago? Uh, It wasn't a ballot measure per se, but the special uh, election for the House seat in Alabama where Marilyn Lands, who, by the way, lost that district by Mm -hmm. points in 2022, Trump won it uh, in 2020, came back to win it by 25 points in like deep red Alabama, right? Because she spoke personally about her own experiences, right? 
when it comes to uh, reproductive uh, choice and reproductive freedom. And I think you're right. Is that the way that the Democrats have understood in those, you know, ballot initiatives in those states you mentioned and in others, that the way to talk about the issue is, you know, I think it's something the vice president who I work for speaks very effectively about, which is that the government should not be in the business of telling women the decisions that they should make out their own bodies. And I do think that with that freedom framing, it's extremely effective. Obviously, there are dynamics in Florida, a state right. where we see a number of you know Hispanic folks who you know, including Cuban Americans and others who might lean more conservative on the issue of uh, of abortion. But you know, I do think that the um, that the you know the measure will will have great success, and we'll just have to wait and see the effect okay. that, that has you know on the presidential. Well, look, this, the six week ban in Florida is pulling around 20 percent of support. I mean, right. this is like 80, 20 kind of thing. So I understand what you're saying about Cubans, et cetera. But 80, 20 is not not like there's not a whole lot of, no. of fight there. Right. And, and, I'm and on the daylight other, on that one. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing is, look, I think I think this actually puts North Carolina further in play, too. Because yeah. Biden only lost North Carolina by 74,000 votes. If you're in North Carolina, the place you went to w- w- was p- potentially Florida, which you won't be able to now because of six-week ban. So it's now like uh, you you got to go way north. Virginia, I think, uh, is, is the closest place if you're a woman and, and, and want to mm-hmm. exercise your reproductive freedom. That's where you have to go because of this ruling. So you got that. You also look as somebody who's worked in a lot of presidential campaigns, as Stuart and, and, and Rick know this, when you lose a presidential campaign, you're not very popular back home right away. And you might right. get it back someday, but there's a whole bunch of people who've done that and been in, you, you know, at the sure. low point of their. Uh, so DeSantis is not like after signing the six week ban that's yeah. only supported by 20 percent. And then you got Rick Scott. Who like, oh, yeah, he's going to go out and campaign hard to support the six week ban, uh, you know, all that. Stuff. And, and he's not well liked anyway. And Democrats actually have Debbie McCarcel uh, Powell, a woman who I think, I mean, just for this moment is perfect to be the, the kind of, you know, the person that goes into battle against Scott. So, I, you know, look, if if Biden, I agree with you guys, don't know whether Biden can actually win the state or not, but if he keeps it. Within single, even high single digits, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. she could she could take Rick Scott out, and and that alone makes. And, and by the way, it may help Biden take North Carolina. So mm-hmm. I, I just think whether whether uh, Biden can take Florida or not, this is a game changer. It could make this keep actually make the Senate again more possible for Democrats to hold on to, and and make and actually put North Carolina in play. If it even if and it could potentially put Florida in play, but it may also wait. it may also have a knock on effect in Georgia too. I think yeah, yeah. Um, same reason because there is a pretty big cohort of pro-choice women, including Republican women, Correct. especially in the Donut and outside of Atlanta, yeah. because th- this is not that that is that is definitely part of the coalition that helped Biden, Warnock, and Ossoff win in that state, and and I think that. If this becomes the topic of conversation for a Rick Scott or for a Trump in Georgia or North Carolina, you've got a, a big cohort of educated women who are who are livid about this subject. Oh, who are who are yeah. not gonna who are not gonna treat it, you know, as as the fifth or sixth or tenth issue on their agenda, but the first or second. Especially with someone like Mark Robinson running yeah. like, the Georgia race <laughs> exactly. in North Carolina. He's exactly. Like, not good good he's point. Yeah. Time yeah. and time again, I, you know, help the Democrats. So, you know. Gavin, before, before uh, we can't, can't, can't let you get out of here without giving us, give us your feeling about how the Biden campaign is doing in Georgia. What, I think, how, yeah. how do you feel about it? Look, I think. I was honestly very surprised in 2020. Um, I, you know, was not one who was expecting uh, the yep. state of Georgia to go for. It was actually funny. One of my my good friends, uh, he's from North Carolina. I'm from Georgia. And I remember in 2019, you know, he was telling me we were on a on a trip, and he was like, "Bro, like I promise you, 2020 Dems are taking both Senate seats and the presidency in Georgia." And I was like, "There is no way. I know my state." And, you know, maybe your state, North Carolina, will do, but it's going to be a little bit of time for my state, for states like Texas. Right. Uh, and I was very glad to be sorely wrong. Um, 
but it wasn't just 2020 that Democrats, you know, won in 2022 with the mm-hmm. Warnock runoff. Again, thanks to a candidate like Herschel Walker, right? Like, yeah, it went to the runoff, but like, look at look at the the you know the victory that her uh, that a Warnock was able to win against such a famed and storied you know football star, you know, like Herschel Walker. But sure. I, mean, I think I think the Biden campaign, going back to what we we're talking about earlier, you know, I think if they continue to do the work in Georgia, if they continue to hit especially the black voters. Who are in you know the Atlanta metro area, and it's not just Atlanta; it's the suburbs as well, where we sure. also have a number yeah. of suburban voters, suburban women who might be you know certainly uh, compel- you know uh, rightfully repelled by the Republican, the MAGA Republicans' messaging on abortion, and might be brought into the Democratic um, fold on that issue. And then there's some other you know cities in the state that you know have helped us in the past, uh, Columbus, Savannah, and Florida, sure. right? Yeah. Yes, sleep on those cities. So I think the Biden campaign has a tremendous opportunity you know, with, uh, you know, the, the what they've delivered for the state of Georgia. It's so funny because Brian Kemp, right, always goes out there and, you know, he was so anti, you know, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act and all of these bills that all the Republicans voted for. And then thanks to like all the money that the IRA has brought, you know, for EV manufacturing, we've seen all these sure. companies open up plants and he's out there, you know, truly to like the president said in the State of the Union last year, see you at the groundbreaking, right? Like it's just the hypocrisy is rich. <laughs> and so I think the Biden campaign has a lot to show for what they've done in Georgia the past few years, you know, provided they continue to do the work with, you know, minority voters and continue to use, you know, reproductive freedom as something that galvanizes suburban women voters. I think they have a really good shot. So, well, right, Gavin, I want to, Gavin, I want to thank you for joining us tonight and, uh, and, and we look forward to having you back again soon. Um, I want to, I, I want to wrap up tonight by saying folks, uh, expressing my great thanks, uh, to everybody who is a resolute square viewer or subscriber, uh, and a, and a Lincoln project supporter or subscriber. Um, we, we were nominated for another Webby award this year, just found that out today. And, um, and um, the, the kind of content that we produce here at Resolute and over at Lincoln, uh, we think is important to this pro-democracy fight. And we appreciate each and every one of you for tuning in and for supporting us in whatever way you do. We will see you again next time. Appreciate everybody coming out tonight. Uh, and uh, we will talk to you again next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for being Thanks, with Kevin. us. Thanks, Kevin. For sure. Yeah. All right. See you guys. Bye.